Hi everyone, I'm Jack. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm here to talk a little bit about failure. Um, it's early in the morning, early in the morning for me, so if you guys could just sort of settle in, relax. Um, I'm pretty much the only one that can fail here, and if I do, then it's probably on theme. So what do I do? I run a studio called Motherbird with uh, two friends that I started with at university. We um, took, the, took the plunge, so straight after university we decided to um, open our doors and open a design studio. So I know a fair bit about um, ups, downs, lefts, rights, backwards, forwards, um, failures and successes of starting a studio. And I'm going to share a couple of them with you today. So aside from my skin's inability to absorb vitamin D and turn it into a tan, my biggest failure is my desire for everything to go perfectly. Um, and you're probably thinking, what a wanker, um, perfection, desire for perfection is not a failure. Um, but the problem with this is um, when you want something to go perfectly, and, this, and I'm, not relate, I'm not talking about just design here, I'm talking about life in general. When you want something to go absolutely perfectly all the time, you put an enormous amount of pressure on yourself, which results in a fair bit of fear. And the issue with that is that for something to go perfectly, you usually follow a set, rule, a set of rules that you know will result in it going your way. So which means you don't push yourself, you don't get outside your comfort zone, you just do things the way that you know how they're done. I've got a few quotes in here as well, and this is one of my favourites. So how do we define failure? Um, having known I was talking about this for a while, I've been asking people, um, what they think failure is and what failure means to them. And the question is, is always, well, how do you define failure? And I don't usually like doing this, but I decided to Google it. Um, and you come up with some interesting things when you do this. And one of them was an unexpected outcome. And I thought, well, what the hell is an unexpected outcome? Because everything's unexpected. If, if we went through life knowing what was happening, then things would be very, very different. So I want to share a couple of things that I think are unexpected. You might have seen this one before. <laughs> <laughs> the cat was... <laughs> as much as it looks like cat suicide, the cat is trying to get to that other bench. And <laughs> it's definitely ambitious, I'll give you that. There's a, risk, there's a risk there. But there's no way that that cat expected to fall. Unexpected, definitely unexpected. I could watch this one all day. <laughs> if anyone's seen that one with sound, it is absolutely hilarious. He makes this, he grips to the ball and you can hear his skin gripping on the rubber. It's quite, um, I seem really sadistic at this point in time and I'm not, and you're all laughing, so. Um, but we built. Oh, it doesn't show up. The white doesn't show up. We built the studio around unexpected things happening. Um, so when we started the studio, um, basically everything from now has been completely unexpected. Um, I probably didn't expect to be here today, not, certainly not running a studio in five years' time. Um, and I suppose everything in life is unexpected. If we're expecting things, then as I said earlier, think, uh, everything would be entirely different. We wouldn't have, probably wouldn't have all the problems that we have in the world today. If we go into a project with a preconceived idea of how it's going to be at the end of the project, then for me, that's a bit of a failure. That's a failure to um, uncover new ideas. That's a failure to push boundaries, and that's a failure to be outside your comfort zone. So unexpected things are good. So I'm going to rule that out as a possibility. The second definition that I found was lack of success. And this one's really interesting as well, because again, 
how do you define success? Is it your happiness? Is it your family that defines your success? Your friends, uh, your bank account, uh, the size of your house? Um, <laughs> or, is, or, or is it you that defines your success? So I've got a couple of examples of things that I think are successful failures. So they sort of, you could, you could call them for one reason or another, um, either of these. So Vincent van Gogh. And you're probably thinking, no, 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 this guy isn't a failure. You must be wrong. He sold paintings for 53.9 million, 82.5 million. He's got paintings like this, which is very famous. <laughs> This one, which you definitely know, and of course, The Starry Night. But it's this painting that probably defines Vincent the most, because this, this is the only painting he sold in his entire life. So he would have gone through his life. He was incredibly disturbed and eventually committed suicide. Most of you might know that. Um, and he did cut off his ear. Um, but he would have gone through his life thinking that he was a complete failure. And we've got this perception of him that he's incredibly, incredibly successful. So he didn't even get to share in any of his own success, which is, you know, quite sad, really. He, I don't think his, his life ambitions were to sell a painting for 82.9 or 5 million 100 years after he passed away. The next one, which you probably recognise a little bit more, <laughs> and I, I hope Wolf Hollands isn't watching, but the London Olympics brand mark. Now, when this came out, this caused a huge amount of uproar. People were going, what the hell is this? I can't believe, you know, someone paid for this. I can't believe it went through client approval. I can't believe anyone approved it. But they did. And I, I felt the same at the time. And I was, a, I was a lot younger. I think I was at university. And I thought I could do better than that. I think now I'm wrong, having had this conversation with, with Nick recently, that the amount of publicity and press that this logo generated through discussion. People were talking about the London Olympics. The non-designers were talking about the design of the London Olympics. It generated so much talk that it was essentially, a, probably, the, I, for me, the most successful Olympic brand that has ever existed. It could have just been another Olympic logo, and we know what they tend to look like. So let's rule out lack of success. So I've got an opinion. I think failure is synonymously linked with risk. So anything that we can potentially fail, we will perceive as a risk, which is fine. But the problem with that is, and my next slide's not gonna work, um, the problem with that is it's linked to fear. So anything that, that we think is a risk, we fear. So we're scared of things that we know there are potential consequences that we don't like. And as a result of that, which is quite apt, we do nothing. <laughs> um, so we don't take a risk at all. So if we do nothing, we have nothing to fear, we have nothing to risk, and therefore we cannot fail. But the really interesting point of this is fear. So fear is something that is instilled in us as adults from probably a relatively early adulthood stage, we're told, how to behave, we're told what to say, what not to say, what to do, what not to do. Um, we're basically conforming to some sort of uh, general view of how we should be. But the interesting thing about it is when we're kids, we don't have any fear whatsoever. We don't understand what risk is. So therefore, we do things that perhaps we probably shouldn't be doing. The amount of roofs I've jumped off when I was a kid or jumped over fences and been chased by dogs, water bomb people, um, you know, done ridiculous things on bikes, dropped into half pipes on, I want to say my skateboard, but I rollerbladed and I, <laughs> I can't lie to you guys. Um, but I mean, I think it's probably more of a personal uh, reputation risk rollerblading than, than um, <laughs> skateboarding anyway. But when we're kids, we don't we don't have any of that, so we just go on and we live our lives and we do things that um, we want to do at the time and they pay off in, in spades. But now when we're adults, we do all of these things because we're expected to be a certain way, so we don't take these risks. So I think fear is really, really li linked to all of these things. So you miss 100% of the shots you don't take, Wayne Gretzky. Um, 
He is an ice hockey player, not a philosopher, but I absolutely love this quote. I think it, nothing could be truer. Um, it's, it's really, really straightforward, and I really like it. So for me, the blank canvas is failure. Um, there are an enormous amount of people out there that have huge ability, um, much more ability than you know, some of the best designers around the world, but they don't take these risks. They don't um, put themselves in a position where they can possibly succeed because they're scared. And for me, that's, I find that upsetting, seeing people that are in that position. So when I was smaller, and I know what you're thinking, probably impossible, but <laughs> I was once upon a time. Um, definite leader of people on the, on the uh, left there. Mud on brother's face. Um, and Chris actually asked me yesterday about that one. What is growing out of your head? And I didn't really have an answer at the time. Uh, but whatever it was, it must have stopped. Um, but my story here is when my brother and I were kids... Um, we were always encouraged to try new foods. And I know I've got a bit of a food story here. It's probably not 100% relevant, but we were always encouraged to try new things. And so, you know, if I had a plate of food and there was a pumpkin on there and I'd go, not having that, parents would go, you've got to try it. You can't say no to something unless you've tried it. Most of the time, you could get away with it and a bit of spite and go, <laughs> I told you so, I didn't like it, and spit it up. But a lot of the time, you'd find something new, you'd enjoy something. And so it was about taking that, and it's not a huge risk, but it's something that I've tried to take from my childhood and go, well, hang on, things could end up really bad, or things could actually work out in a way. So I try and remember that from time to time. So failure in design, what is that? Um, that's essentially what we do as designers. When we're uh, if we've got a brief to come up with whatever it is, we might come up with 30 different ideas, which then get narrowed down to three that we might present, which ultimately the client will choose one. Ultimately, they usually choose all three, mash them together, and it becomes one. <laughs> but initially, we've got these 30 ideas. Let's say we've got 30 ideas. So are those 29 other ideas, are they failures in a way? Or is this you know, just, just linked to graphic design? So my doctor, who's coincidentally an eye stock model, <laughs> um, let's just say he is, um, he takes 30 attempts to diagnose someone with um, a life-threatening disease. For a start, don't go back to the 30th time, change doctor. But he doesn't have that opportunity, so creativity is subjective. Um, <laughs> It's, uh, it's something that you might often think that you've got right and your client, you know, sometimes there's right answers, sometimes there's wrong answers, sometimes there's just answers. Um, and a lot of the time you'll think you've got something right and your client will go, no, 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 this is completely wrong. And you'll go, well, I think it's right. Um, so designers straddle this um, area of success and failure, black and white, sitting in this gray area of this, this unknown. So we're very close to failing a lot of the time, but we're also very close to succeeding and sometimes you're not quite sure. So those 29 other ideas that I was talking about, they're just a phase of development. They're stepping stones from getting from A to B so that you know you have to get to a goal and these are all a learning curve along the way. And this is a quote that sums it up probably best by Samuel Beckett, which is written there. So risky business. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we started the studio straight out of university, um, which is the biggest risk because most businesses fail. 95% um, of businesses fail in the first five years. So if 100 of us in here started a, statistically, if 100 of, 100 of us in here started a studio, five of us would have it in five years' time. And I think after the first year, 50% of, of businesses fail. So we didn't know that at the time, which was sort of nice because um, that wouldn't be a very comforting thought. So that was one of the risks that we took to start the studio. The second risk was inexperience. We knew, knew absolutely nothing. We, um, we all had the same sort of skill and knowledge level, so we had to learn everything as we went. But um, in terms of starting a business, we didn't know how to charge. We didn't know how to speak to clients. We didn't know how to present work. We didn't know how to deal with each other. We didn't know how to... Um, run 
projects from start to finish timeline wise. There were so many things that we had no idea how to do. So with that inexperience, that's a huge risk because I, I don't know how we got through to be honest, but we're here. Um, reputation, that's another big risk. So what happens when you start a studio? You go and you tell your friends, your friends tell their friends, you tell your family, you put it on Facebook, you make a little web page, you put it on Twitter, you might get a write-up in a magazine. There's a bit of hype going around. So to then fail from that point, from a reputation point of view, you feel pretty shitty externally, but also you feel really bad internally as well to have to wind up a studio. So there's a big risk there, and if, if you pull it off, it's a big reward as well. One of the things that we did Early on, we signed a lease that was probably a little too big. Um, don't tell our real estate agent that. Um, they were happy. Uh, it, it wasn't huge in any, in any way, but we didn't have the money at the time. We had a little bit of money. We knew that we could probably pay the lease, but we weren't sure how much we'd be paying ourselves. So what that did, what that risk did, that put pressure on us, which I think pressure is sometimes good, um, it put pressure on us to go, hang on, shit, we need to start doing things now. So we really, we took this risk that we would fail, the bank might chase after us or we wouldn't get any money for the year and, um, and then we'd be screwed. But what, yeah, what it did, it made us work harder for what we really needed to get. So our approach, this one's not going to work here. Failing is the only way to know where the boundaries lie. So basically... We do this with all of our work. We'll push our clients to the very edge, we'll put, push ourselves to the very edge and see what we can learn, how we can develop. Um, and I guess if you, if you think about it, if you push your client here or you push yourself here, man or your client, they'll pull back to here. But if you push them here, then they're gonna pull back to here and here's a hell of a lot better than here. So what we do, we try and add this to all of our work and that's work that you know, we take on projects and we go, not sure what to do here, let's push it as far as we possibly can. And that usually, um, the risk outweighs, uh, sorry, the success outweighs any failure. We've also had pretty much no choice starting a studio all at the same level, trying to figure out where, how to do what. Um, we've had to learn off each other and just develop things along the way. There's no senior designer or creative director to tell us how things should be. Another quote, this one's by De Bono. It's better to have enough ideas for some of them to be wrong than to always be right by having no ideas at all. Um, I've got a little story here, Purple Dinosaur. So I know someone that is a set director and this is, I think this is an old advertising trick, but what they do, they'll design their dream set and the client will come in They'll design the dream set, sorry, and they'll have it all finished and then they'll put this purple dinosaur just in the corner. And the client will come in, they'll walk in, have a look around and go, it's all right, get rid of the dinosaur. Dinosaur's gone, problem solved, they get their dream set. <laughs> the risk is that you end up with a purple dinosaur on, you know, perhaps a period TV show or I'm not quite sure. Um, so there's, there's a fair element of risk there. Um, but the success is that they they obviously get their, their dream thing because the client always wants to change something. So they've given them the obvious thing to change. I've used that before and it's screwed up big time. <laughs> um, so it is definitely, definitely a risk. So what we do, we, we say yes, um, which I think is really important. If you don't know how to do something, if you're not quite sure, and, but you know that there's some capability somewhere, then you say yes and then you figure it out. So we do that with all of our projects. We'll, we're not sure how to do something at the start or we'll come up with an idea, present it, and then the client will approve it. We'll come back, sit in the studio and go, we've got no idea how to do this, but we're gonna give it a go. And I think that that's really important because that pushes you outside your comfort zone. Again, you're teetering on the edge of failure and sometimes things work, sometimes things don't, but the this, this success is way better than just sticking within your comfort zone. So I guess you're probably saying, you're just telling me to fail. Um, not really the answer. Um, I don't want you to go out there and just try and fail everything. But what you have to do, you have to team up with fear. So you have to understand what you're scared of. You have to understand why you're scared of it. 
and you have to figure out ways that you can potentially get rid of those fears. Usually it's by taking risks and throwing yourself in the deep end. You have to find the boundaries, as I was talking about before, and you have to extend them. So wherever you think they are, you keep pushing them and trying to get them further and further away so that your comfort zone is way bigger than it was before. I think this is really important. I don't think anyone can tell, tell you how to fail. You know what your success measurements are. You know what your failure measurements are. It's really frustrating when people say they really screwed that up or they did this or that. Um, I think it's got to certainly come within and it's really important that you're not too harsh on yourself and you do figure out that failure is important um, and it's one of those steps along the way, which is embracing failure. So it's, it, is, it is really important to understand it is, that it, it exists. And that was my point from the very beginning, that the fact that I have wanted everything to go perfectly all the time is a real bar to, um, to real success or real, um, you know, real enjoyment in, in what you do. So you have to embrace failure, realise it exists, and then um, get on with it. So the time to fail is now. Um, it's not tomorrow, and especially if you're at university or tertiary education, that is like an incubation period where you can just make as many mistakes as possible, learn who you are, um, challenge, challenge the status quo, whatever you can possibly do, you do now in the confines of, of tertiary, because when you have a hovering art director, um, tiny budgets, ridiculous deadlines, and a lot at stake, you can't afford to make mistakes, or very rarely. So if, if you're not at university, then take on personal projects on the side and start screwing up with them and learning what you're capable of. Because if you can understand what you're capable of and what's possible, then it makes everything, it makes when you fail a hell of a lot easier. And if you don't like anything I said today, then you can always listen to Homer. <laughs> Thank you.